So one of the things that we've, uh, you know, we pay a lot of attention to what's going on in the national press about higher ed, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure you read some of that stuff, but probably not as avidly as, as we do. And there's a kind of narrative out there about higher education that I think drives Mary and me both a little bit crazy uh, because we don't think it's an accurate description of what's going on in higher ed, but it's a tendency to focus on some of the challenges, which are real, but I think it, the, the overall narrative tends to um, be more critical of higher ed, and, and my biggest concern is it tends to make students and parents wonder, you know, is higher ed really all it's cracked up to be? Is it something my, my son or daughter should really be focusing on, or is that, you know, is it really not essential anymore? And, and I think we both agree, obviously we're a little biased given our jobs, but um, you know, higher ed is absolutely essential for uh, talented, ambitious, young people to get the kind of education they need to give them the success, you know, both professionally, I mean, that matters a lot, but personally as well. It's not just about jobs and careers, um, but a, a college degree is absolutely the, the first step on a path to a, a, what we hope for most of our students will be a successful, you know, personal, professional, community life. And uh, so that I think there are kind of four things going on nationally that I think we've tried to kind of think about here and then counter to some extent in our strategic plan. Um, the first is this question about the liberal arts and the you know, broad-based education. Is that really what students need these days? There's a lot of talk focusing on, on vocations and, and the, the career piece and college uh, as a means to an end, simply an instrumental uh, view of higher education, that it's simply you go to college, you get a job, and that's the purpose. <clears throat> now we certainly think our students should have jobs when they graduate, right? We don't want them home living in your basement. Um, neither do you. Um, but we think that it's a lot more than that. And we also think that it's not about the first job. And, and when we think about the education here, our view is, what's the best education for our students for a lifetime? Not for that first job. We're not going to say, you're, you know, come and study X because at the end of four years, there'll be a job in X waiting for you. We could do that, but I think what would happen two or three years later when they wanted to do something different? What would happen, uh, what happens as the economy changes 10 years later, 20 years later? So our view is that a liberal arts education is absolutely the best preparation for life in the 21st century, and that's where our students are going to be living. So um, we want to try to counter that narrative that, jo that it's all about jobs and especially that first job. It's, it's really about what's something much broader than that. Uh, the second thing that we are seeing nationally, and this isn't so much of a criticism of higher ed, but it's an acknowledgment of the way the world is changing. And there's a lot of discussion about changing demographics in, uh, in this country and in Minnesota in, in specific, but more generally in the U.S. And as you know, it was probably, probably four or five years ago now, if you look at births of, uh, of infants, we became a majority minority uh, country about four or five years ago. So more than half the babies that were born were not uh, Caucasian. So they're babies of not the typical majority. And that, you know, we're seeing some of that in our schools already. We know that in Minnesota, high school populations have been relatively flat, and, they're, and the growth we're going to see in the next four or five, ten years is going to be primarily, not exclusively, but primarily among students of color. And so we need to have a uh, uh, educational um, program and product that addresses the needs of those students. And a, a lot of, in a lot of cases, those students are going to be first-generation students. They'll come from families that didn't have college educations in the background. And that's a slightly different set of needs than our traditional majority, often second or third generation college student. And so that's one of the things we wanted to, to address here was the changing demographics of Minnesota, but, as well, and, but the United States as well as we're becoming a more geographically diverse um, pair of schools already. The, the third thing that, that has come up in the conversations about higher ed tends to think a little bit about or, or be critical of the kinds of students we graduate into the world. Um, David Brooks, who writes for the New York Times, has kind of been the most um, articulate on this. But we, we've heard in lots of other things as well where the students are being criticized for not having thought very much about meaning or about values or what's important to them in life, that they kind of get on a path. There's a book that was written recently which I very much dislike called Excellent Sheep where the, the hypothesis is that um, the students that we generate are uh, very talented academically, but they don't think very much. They kind of get on the path, and they can you know, check off the boxes and be successful, but 
they end up being investment bankers or consultants and they don't think very hard about you know, what the right choices are, how they should try to find meaning and value in their lives. Now, I think that description is, is very unfair, but I think one of the things that we wanted to address in our strategic plan was an acknowledgement that one of the things we hope that our students will do while they're at St. Ben's and St. John's is think about those questions of meaning. What's important to them? What are the values that they think are, are going to bring them um, satisfaction throughout their lives? We want them to be thinking about something more than themselves. We want them to be thinking about community when they're here, but being engaged in community once they graduate from St. Ben's and St. John's. And so that's a third uh, part of our strategic plan that got, ties into our Catholic and Benedictine heritage. And then finally, the other piece, and this is probably the piece of the, of the national discussion that um, gets the most press, it has to do with the economic model of higher education and concern about the costs of places like St. Ben's and St. John's. And those, those concerns are real. They're, they concern us every day. I mean, this is an expensive model. Um, as a parent who's kind of at the end of that, at least for the college days, you know, maybe you don't have to sweat this but with, in the same way that freshman parents do, but, but you spend a lot of money for your son's education. And you know, if you have other children, if they're going to go to places like this, it, it is expensive. We cannot deny that fact. The model we have, um, we, we think carefully about how to try to keep costs down, but the model we have with small classes and a lot of staff and faculty around to help students it's just an expensive model. And so one of the things as part of our strategic plan is to try to think about the long-term economic model for St. Ben's and St. John's. And you know, we're not the only ones thinking about this. Every school like us is thinking about this as well. But we want to make sure that we want to continue to provide exceptional quality and, an, uh, and a wonderful experience for our students. At the same time, we try to figure out how to keep the costs under control so that we can have access, so that students can have access so that students from any economic background can think about this as an option for their education. So, you know, those are the four things that I think we're seeing in some of the national discussion, you know, the liberal arts piece, the, the character piece, the demographic change, and then the economic piece. And all of those were kind of in the back of our minds as we started the strategic planning process a year and a half ago. And what we've, we've come up with addresses some of those issues. So with that, maybe I'll turn it over to my colleague. And so let her talk about the specifics of what yeah. we've done. So we spent the entire year last year working on developing the strategic plan with those issues in mind that Michael has articulated. But we wanted to be certain that whatever plan we developed, everyone in our communities had some input into and had some buy-in with. And so over the course of last year, we spoke with over a 1,000 different constituents of St. Ben's and St. John's in crafting this plan. So we met with our trustees and faculty. We met with students, um, alums across the country, held focus groups that we participated in. We met with business leaders. Uh, our monastic communities did focus groups with us. So what we decided to do is within or against rather this big backdrop that Michael has discussed, how do we then figure out what does that mean specifically for St. Ben's and for St. John's? And so we did this narrowing in by talking with so many different people and it became clear very early in the conversation that there was some consistency in what people hoped and aspired to for St. Ben's and St. John's. Um, and the first piece that really came to the forefront is a recommitment to our liberal arts background. So as Michael said, the public narrative right now is really questioning the value of the liberal arts. But we decided to make an intentional and explicit commitment to the liberal arts in our strategic plan. And I'll just go through some of the photos just because we put them together. Those were some of the focus groups that we held. Um, and I'll come back to the vision statements at the end. So our, our first commitment was to liberal arts for life. And I'll describe some of the uh, strategies and metrics around that. But that's how we've distilled the first item that Michael spoke about, rearticulating a commitment to the liberal arts. Next, Michael talked about the importance of character development and moral education, and for us, that's rooted in our Catholic and Benedictine heritage. So I think the most distinctive fact about St. Ben's and St. John's is our sense of community, and that sense of community comes from our monastic communities that we hail from. So we wanted a recommitment to that, but recognizing that it needed to be inclusive and engaging. About 60% of our students are Catholic, but the other 40% come from a variety of religious traditions or from no religious tradition. So we wanted to be certain that everyone felt embraced by that heritage. 
Next, the language we used for our economic model is shared future, sustainable future. And we chose that language because we wanted to make an explicit commitment to the fact that St. Ben's and St. John's are connected to one another. We are separate institutions. We are not planning on any merger. But we recognize that our future relies on one another. So we wouldn't have 1,900 Bennies or 1,800 Johnnies here if we didn't have one another. And we're very clear about that. Um, and that we want that future to be sustainable, not just in the next five years, but really for the long run. Hi, come on in. Pull up a chair. At St. Ben's and St. John's, we want everyone at the table together. So come on in. We were just talking about the strategic plan. Michael gave some higher ed context generally, and we're just starting to talk about the, uh, the specifics with, within the strategic plan. So welcome. So the third pillar was shared future, sustainable future, and the fourth pillar is titled the holistic and transformational development of women and men. And that's really where we speak to the leadership and character development, the professional and personal development of our, of our students. And so I'll go into each of those in some, in a little bit more detail. So as you know, we are liberal arts institutions. Um, we remain among the top 100 liberal arts institutions in the United States at this point, as rated by US News and World Reports, which is a fraught way to measure yourself, but it is a way that people measure us. And we're committed to being liberal arts institutions. We believe that students should come in and have a world of academic opportunities available to them and to take advantage of those opportunities, not just within their uh, major field of study, but across various fields of study. And for us, liberal arts for life means a number of different things. It means certainly their academic experience in the classroom, but it also means things like study abroad, which is really important, or our fine arts programming, which hopefully you will take advantage of tonight. All of that combines to provide a deep and rich liberal arts experience at St. Ben's and St. John's. Within the strategic plan, we're really looking from a very small lens to the biggest lens when we talk about liberal arts for life. So we think that the common curriculum, and your, your children will tell you which courses they're currently taking in the common curriculum, is fundamental, that it is kind of the centerpiece of our liberal arts experience, but that it then sort of spirals out to include our experiential learning curriculum. So all of our students have some experiential learning experience while they're at St. Ben's and St. John's, whether it's internships or undergraduate research, perhaps it's um, doing an internship abroad or service learning. And then we are actually looking at expanding our liberal arts all the way out to continuing liberal arts education and perhaps doing some study ab abroad programs with parents and alums. So we're really looking at liberal arts for life within this particular strategic plan from both the micro sort of level of the student's experience in the common curriculum to how we embrace the entire community in our liberal arts experience. And so this is the statement of commitment that we're making at St. Ben's and St. John's, that we will have an innovative and integrative curriculum that provides knowledge, skills, experiences, and values to help shape our students' professional and personal goals, and importantly, to shape their civic identity. When we look at um, what's happening nationally and globally, having civically engaged citizens is critically important. And we believe the liberal arts is one of the best ways of achieving that. So we have a few goals, and I, I won't go into them. I'll just read the, the major one. Create, create, a lip, create a leading and innovative liberal arts curriculum that prepares students for life. And then within that, there are a variety of tactics that we'll take. We also need to meet the aspirations and expectations of 21st century student body. And this is important around making sure our faculty and our staff are prepared to work with all of the students that we have at St. Ben's and St. John's. Because students bring a variety of complicated needs to college now, I think far more complicated than what we brought to college when we attended. And we need to be certain that we're addressing those needs and that we're investing in supports to do that. And then we measure ourselves with various metrics. So right now, St. Ben's and St. John's has among the highest first to second year retention rates of 
institutions in the United States, we're averaging around 89, 88, 89%. And it may sound like, well, moving to 90 is not a big deal. It's probably one of the hardest metrics that we have in our strategic plan. Um, students come to St. Ben's and St. John's and they stay, but we need to make certain that more of them stay. So we're looking to move that to 90%. We're looking to actually also enhance our four-year completion rate. Our graduation rate, again, is among the highest in the country in terms of um, institutions like us. The average private four-year college graduation rate for four years is around 64%, so we're certainly exceeding that. And that may actually be the six-year graduation rate, to be honest. It may be the six-year. And we measure ourselves in four-year increments because we welcome your children. We love them dearly for four years. But at the end of four years, they need to go and embrace the next phase of their lives. I think you want that. Economically, we all want that. Um, and so we are really trying to promote that as well. And then we're going to look at some scores in terms of how our students measure um, their experience at St. Ben's and St. John's. And again, trying to move those scores a bit looking at some national engagement scores as well. Do you want to add to what you want to score? No, I think you've done a fabulous job. Well, thank you, Michael. I appreciate You're that. Um, so we are really interested in and engaged with the liberal arts. Do you have questions about that pillar before we move to the next one? Or comments or ideas? No? Do you have questions or comments or ideas of those most directly impacted? Mm -hmm. No? OK. So the next pillar um, is called the Holistic and Transformational Development of Women and Men. And it's within this pillar that we look at really preparing and supporting students from a holistic perspective. So academically, again, St. Ben's and St. John's excel. And I have to share my favorite academic fact about St. Ben's and St. John's is that we are among the top 40 colleges and universities in the United States in terms of the number of Fulbright scholars we produce. So academically, we're, we're doing, I think, a wonderful job. But we know that students can't excel in the classroom if they're troubled by other issues, if they aren't prepared, if they have concerns about their professional trajectory, if they're not sure how to find resources. I was with a student at the involvement fair the other day, a first year. And she said, it's really much more difficult than I thought it would be, and I don't know what to do. And I said, you go meet with every one of your faculty members, and you tell them where your difficulties are. And then you go to tutoring every day or twice a day, and you don't, be, don't feel ashamed in, with the need to do that. But some students don't know that. They don't know that that's perfectly acceptable, that it doesn't mark you as less than to take advantage of those resources. And this is the pillar where we commit to um, really promoting the holistic development of young people. And while the entire strategic plan is joint, it's within this pillar that we make slightly different commitments. Because as you can imagine, preparing young women holistically and to have a transformational experience is slightly different than preparing young men. So we certainly want to encourage our Bennies to live lives with integrity and purpose. That's critically important. But one of the most important things we need to do at St. Ben's is to help young women utilize their voice and to build their confidence as they prepare to go out into the world. And our Bennies have great compassion, but they don't always assess their confidence at the levels we need them to assess it. And then we want them to engage with diverse perspectives and peoples, inspiring them to meet their full potential. Michael should speak to the St. John's. Commitment. Well, I think just to step back for just a second, I think one of the things that's most relevant about this pillar is that it's the place where our unique model comes to the fore. And as you, you know, those of you that are involved in this world, you know, understand the St. Ben St. John's relationship. But we go out into the world and talk to our peers, and we describe a college for women, a college for men, yet a completely integrated academic program, one faculty, one provost. People look at us like we're crazy. They don't quite get, and, and at some level, maybe we are, I mean, because we really are singular. There's no other pair of schools in the country that does what we do. And that can be hard to explain to people, but, and so you might ask, well, well why are you doing it? You know, you could create a different model. Why don't you, you know, could you 
merge? Could you both go co-ed? Well, we've, we've decided based on the experience of our students that to be two separate institutions, one for women and one for men, that work together and recruit together and have a common academic program, but have separate programming for men and women in certain parts of the experience uh, is very important for our students. We can address, as Mary noted, for women, sometimes we, we look at the data and if you look at their academic performance and you look at their confidence, they don't pair up. Interesting, men, you can sometimes see the reverse of that, right? You look at performance and you see confidence and men are often more confident than their, than their um, academic credentials might suggest. Now, I'm not saying we should bring men's confidence down. I think there's some you know, benefits. Sometimes you fake it till you make it, and, and sometimes our Johnnies are pretty good at that. <laughs> but the, the more general point is that women have different issues than men do, and this pillar allows us to program for those two separate groups. At a co-ed place, it would be harder for them to say, and, and I, you know, we both know this from having been at co-ed places before we came here, it would be a little hard to say, this is a program for women only. There, you know, people would say, well, wait a minute, this should be a program for all students. Well, the reality is not all students have the same needs, and so for us to be able to say, we're gonna have some specific programming for Benny's, and Johnny's don't feel like they have to have access to Benny's programs because they know their programs for Johnny's as well. And that's kind of the real strength of this separate college for men and college for women, yet working together at the same time. And so in this particular case, you know, we're trying to figure out how to engage. I mean, with women, sometimes the issue is, I mean, if you, if you shorthand it and say it's sometimes an issue of confidence, you know, with men, sometimes it's an issue of engagement. We sometimes get young men that come to campus that clearly have all kinds of potential, but for whatever reason, they don't engage academically in the way that we want them to or they cruised by in high school on their charm and natural intelligence and didn't fully take advantage of their capabilities. And part of what we want to do during their four years is to say, all right, guys, we, we admitted you because we know you have this you know, great potential, even if you haven't used it as fully. And, and I'm going to be, be careful. It's not every student that's like that. But on average, there are men that have not as fully engaged with the academic life in high school as, as our young women have. And so we can think about programming to get that kind of engagement for young men, and St. Ben's can think about the kinds of issues that are important for young women. So just if this is partly my plea for if you're out talking to other parents, you think, what is what's a bizarre model? Why do they do that? But the reason we do that is because we think that it provides a better experience overall for men and women to have this opportunity to have the, the joint academic experience and, of course, all the social co-ed pieces, but also to have some things for men and some things for women because the needs are different. So within this, we have a few strategies, and I'll highlight one that, that really dovetails nicely with what Michael just said. We really want to work on our career development programming because while we don't think you go to college just to get a job, for a number of parents, that's a compelling part of the decision-making process. And I should note that within one year of graduation, 99.5% of St. Ben's and St. John's students are either employed in full-time graduate school or 9.7% have chosen full-time volunteer service, often abroad, as, as what, how they will spend that year. So we are getting those professional outcomes for students. That being said, how do we improve on that? And that's a place where, while we share the investment in making certain that we have a leading professional and career development curriculum, we are really looking at how we implement that in two different ways. So at St. Ben's, we're trying to figure out how we get young women to be more willing to put themselves out for big name internships or to apply it for jobs at Fortune 500 companies. How do we help young women understand networking? Because we all know networking is important and we all tell students, go network, but we don't always define what that means. So we're really working on that at St. Ben's. On the other side, becoming a mentor-centered community or thinking about um, academic support is a big issue. Well, we know that young men are less likely to go to the writing center or the math skill center. So Michael has taken the lead on reconfiguring space to make it easier for young men to take advantage of those opportunities. So this pillar allows us to really address the unique needs of men and women, as Michael indicated before. And our goals here really reflect where we see the biggest discrepancies in what men and women are doing on our campuses. So we'll take study abroad. 
Right now, 70% of, I'm sorry, 62% of St. Ben's students study abroad compared with 45% of St. John's students. So we want to really figure out how do we both improve, and that will mean different things. So we're aiming to get to 70% at St. Ben's. Um, St. John's is aiming to get to 55%. But that speaks a little bit to the different ways in which men and women are approaching education. Similarly, um, we both need to do some work around getting our students more involved in undergraduate research. We're hoping to move about 10 percentage points. St. John's is hoping to move about 13 percentage points. So those are places where we are going to measure ourselves. But I will confess that, that my favorite metric, probably, in the entire plan is this last one. And it's around reducing gaps in male and female self-reports of confidence. So you'll see that um, Johnny's, 72% of Johnny's rate themselves above average or in the highest 10% with intellectual self-confidence. And that's probably true. I have no issue with that. But only 52% of our Bennies rate themselves that way. So my goal is never, I don't want anyone to think we're hoping Johnny's levels decrease. We're not hoping that at all. Thank you. But we're hoping that the Bennies levels increase because that's, um, they're exceptional, exceptional young women. And you see those discrepancies carry throughout those rates of whether it's academic ability, and, and we have higher numbers of Bennies inducted into Phi Beta Kappa, they have higher GPAs on average, and yet they rate their academic ability 15 percentage points lower than Johnny's right there. So we have some work to do, and I think as a college for women, it's imperative that we do that work. Questions about the holistic and transformational development of women? Then the next um, areas around our inclusive and engaging Catholic and Benedictine experience. And we certainly have a joint goal with this one. And that is we want to extend our Catholic and Benedictine values to create a vibrant community experience. And I said earlier that right now about 60% of our students are Catholic. So putting inclusive and engaging in front of that title was really important because we want 100% of our students to feel welcome and embraced by our Catholic and Benedictine heritage. And I think we do very, very well um, with this particular pillar. Our students feel, I think, a real commitment or connection, rather, to the monastery at St. Ben's and the abbey at St. John's. We have 270 students participating in our Benedictine Friends program this year. St. John's, they have monks on all of the first year student floors. And that builds a connection and it builds, I think, values that our students will carry with them throughout the course of their lives. We wanted to surface this in the strategic plan, though, because one of the realities is that the numbers of religious on our campuses are decreasing. So right now, we have 136 sisters who live on the St. Ben's campus or in in adjoining properties, and that's down from when there were several hundred, if not a thousand, sisters present on the campus. And I don't know the monks' numbers, but I imagine they're Wait, similar. There are about 142 or three monks that are part of the community here. 40, 50 years ago, there were close to 400. So we're seeing these decreases. So how do we keep that legacy alive? Because I, they are the folks who gave us that sense of community. They had the vision for our institutions. So we really are explicitly trying to enhance our identity and community in this pillar and make sure that the intellectual tradition, the Catholic intellectual tradition, surfaces in our academic program and that our co-curricular experiences, which are primary service learning and social justice activities, continue and that they continue to honor Catholic social teaching. Um, that's an area that Michael and I are perhaps some might say getting too involved in as we're going to co-teach a class next semester on Catholic social teaching. So wish us well, say a prayer if you are so inclined. Um, and then we're measuring our, our um, developments in this area. But because this is a new area to quantify, we're having to develop a number of those benchmarks. Yeah, and just to reiterate what Mary said, you know, we don't feel like this is an area where we have huge gaps right now or huge challenges. I think that you know, the students, when they come, they feel a sense of community almost immediately, even before they arrive here. And when they graduate, we ask students to you know, give us 
you know, some words that describe their experience, and community is the number one word that comes up. So we, we feel like we're, we're doing well with that. Now, you know, whether it's the Catholic Benedictine piece could be strengthened, that's, you know, we could debate that. But I think, as Mary noted, the, the bigger question is to make sure that those things continue even as the changing demographics of the monastery and the abbey um, need us to be a little bit more intentional about that Catholic Benedictine community piece in a way that you know, 30 or 40 years ago, it was just kind of in the water. I mean, it was just in the air because there were so many of the Catholic and Benedictine you know, sisters and monks working at the university, teaching, living on campus, etc. So that still exists to some extent, but not to the same extent. And so we need to take ownership of that piece uh, ourselves and not leave it up to the monks or the sisters to be responsible for that. This is just a, a quote um, from a student who is a participant in the Benedict and Friends program. And what is I, the Benedict and Friends program? Uh, Benedict and Friends is a program, and, and I don't know what the equivalent is at St. John's, but at St. Ben's, you're allowed to sign up to have one of the sisters as your Benedict and friend. And, so, and they do activities ranging from volunteering together at a school cleanup to making s'mores. I think next week they do craft making that they then donate and they go to the, the sisters um, for a long time ran St. Cloud Hospital and now they have St. Scholastica, the, the nursing home for the sisters, so they do trips over there. But it's really an opportunity for a young woman to have one of the sisters of the founding order be their Benedictine friend. All students are eligible to participate. It is great fun. They have a lot of fun and I try to get to as many of their events as I can. And this was one when the sisters talked about past, present, and future. And I just highlighted where this young woman in her email said, it added so much more meaning to being a Benny. And when I'm with Benny alums, they all talk about a sister who had a significant impact on their life. I was with a Benny alum in, in DC recently who talked about Sister Coleman O'Connell coming to DC and dragging her back to campus because she wanted to drop out of school and get a job because she had found some job that paid like $4 an hour and it was the most money she'd ever made and she had decided I'm all done. And Sister Coleman, when she was president, went to DC and apparently dragged this young woman back to campus. And so they that, care. <laughs> that happens. That, that seems above and beyond the call to me, but. It's Although you hear stories about, about several monks who've done that, well, you know, yeah. who will go, and, and that's what they did, and while we don't drag students anymore because that's not legally allowed, <laughs> um, we, do, we do encourage them heartily um, to stay in school. So this photo is what leads into our shared future, sustainable future, because this was the first joint fundraising trip that um, St. Ben's and St. John's, I guess, had taken as far as I know. Ever. And it's a statement, um, it's a trip that we did to the Bahamas, and, the, and it was not a vacation trip. It was trip. Right. No, right. It was. No, when I it was think. cold, it was like in the 60s or something. Um, but it matters, this particular picture matters, because we have a long legacy in the Bahamas. We have, at St. Ben's, a thousand alumni in the Bahamas, and I assume a similar number. Seven or eight hundred. Um, Johnny's, Johnny alums in the Bahamas. And each year they do a fundraiser, and this year they did a fundraiser for Bahamian students we have. And it was our first real joint IA trip. And we share that photo because we will continue to do more joint things. I share this photo because it tortures Michael, because he looks so worried um, at halftime, and I'm very excited at halftime. You'll see that today at halftime. Um, but our... That's our I relationship. Yeah, no, yeah. Oh, me, the worried one? Yeah, and me looking excited, right? <laughs> um, and so, so we, we are committed to working together to improve the economic model. I mean, one of the things that we are very clear about, and this may have something to do with the fact that Michael is certainly the first parent as, as a St. John's president. He's the first lay president. Um, Stan Azurda had children, and Mary Lyons had children while she was president. But I have three, at St. Ben's. Ben's, I have three children, and I worry about college affordability. Michael has three children who are much younger than my children, so he should be really worried about college affordability. Um, but we think about what are the pressures that are being exerted on parents, and 
how do we not have the tuition increases that, that parents have seen? Because it's not, it's not sustainable for families. And as institutions, we can't rely on it. So this pillar really calls us to change our economic model, which is a big, big task. Um, and it's probably what we spend a great deal of time on. And changing your economic model is comprised of a number of things. It's comprised of really controlling your cost. But some of the things we do are expensive. So because we're a people-driven industry, our average class size is about 12 to 1 right now. That demands a lot of faculty in order to do that. I, we think a small class is absolutely worth it. But how do we manage that number, that ratio better? Just, I don't think our class right, our, is our, our ratio, right. We think that ratio has value to it. Another example would be around study abroad. So part of what makes our study abroad program so successful is that they are by and large faculty led which means we are paying for a faculty member to go to we have faculty in Greece right now, for example, with a small group of students. I wouldn't want to compromise on that because there's, there's a factor around safety, there's a factor around what they're learning and the experience. So, but how do we measure or how do we rather contain those costs better? The other side of containing costs is how do you increase your revenue? And if you can't do that through tuition, how do you increase your revenue through other sources, which goes back to the fundraising piece um, that we spend a great deal of time on as well. So we're really looking at the economic model, which means thinking about how we shape our faculty and staff size and composition, which is a, a challenging but important conversation. And then we're looking at the three brands that we have. So, and we have all three brands, perhaps in this room right now, I'm trying to see. No, no one has on a joint shirt. We have our St. Ben's brand and our St. John's brand, and none of us are wearing a jointly brand. Well, the PowerPoint logo in the corner is our joint brand. We also have the Blazers well represented and Johnny's. And so we are, so we're trying to figure out how we manage all three of those brands as we go forward. Um, and that's a, that's a critically important pillar for us. And then we're going to measure that in about two months, we will have a new financial plan for our boards of trustees to take a look at. And that's a big deal, and we're spending a lot of time on it. Oh, look at that photo. I've never seen that one. Is that, can you tell, is that at Cedar Commencement? Is that at yours, or is that at St. Ben's? That's St. John's? Oh, nice. That's a nice one. And then you see photos of all of our students doing things together. That bottom one is last year we won the Outdoor Nation Campus Challenge for the most outdoorsy. Uh, campus in the United States, we're currently in third place. So if you've not signed up, please go to oncampuschallenge.org and sign up as we need your outdoor activity. It's not just students, right? It's, it's not just students. Every, the community broadly defined. Yeah. So, so questions about that? I might try to win that Really? Right. Well, tell me your story? name. Colleen McConnell. Okay. Oh, great. Did you get some prizes as a result of that, I hope? It wasn't that good. I mean, not like I didn't sleep outside. I was doing like one activity a day, not like five. But that's fantastic. OK. Please do sign up. So what we, and this seems like it in the world of Fulbrights and economic models and tuition increases and holding the discount rate, Outdoor Nation Challenge seems like a small thing. Except um, we want a $10,000 outdoor equipment package which offsets other expenses that we have which is really valuable plus i may have told a lot of college presidents we were better than they are and so i can't lose this year um <laughs> michael is less likely to say those things but i'm always saying you know look at us we won i'm just i just marvel as someone who's not from minnesota i marvel at the fact that a school for or two schools from minnesota could win that challenge um, against places in california and the Southeast that where one might expect to be outdoors more often. Well, the other nice thing about it is it, it kind of captures something that's important about and distinctive about us. I mean, we've got this incredible setting in, in the woods of central Minnesota and, and this beautiful area around us. And the students that come here take advantage of it, so it's not, and you know, they, as do their parents and other members of the community as well. So it's, I mean, it was nice that we got this recognition, but I think it just reaffirmed for lots of folks that this is a place where the outdoors and getting engaged physically and, and being active is an important part of what 
our students and our community do. So I think the third place thing, we won last year. They kept s score with points. And I think, didn't we like triple the yeah. second place team? Yeah, so to some extent, I think the community is kind of saying, you know, we've already done this. We won so handily last year. We, you know, I, don't, I think the, the desire to kind of defend our titles, like, you know, we've already done that. We know that we're very active and involved. So uh, Mary's trying to. I'm going to have to because, live outside well, if, <laughs> to get these points up. Well, it's because she put this out there with other college presidents. I was smart enough to, I was more <laughs> benedictinely modest than, yeah. than she was. So I'm feeling less pressure to yeah. win again. Yeah, well, the Bennies are going, we will mobilize. We will. I think Bennies did a lot of, did a lot last year, although the number one was Patrick, and I'm blanking on his last name, but Johnny okay. took the number one spot in the St. Ben St. John's leaderboard. So we'll go well, back to it again. He took the number one in the whole country. In the whole country, he did. I don't know so. how he did any of his academic work, given that he was, because <laughs> you could do five activities a day and post them. They each had to be half an hour long. So this young man was. So you see worry, and I'm, <laughs> go Patrick. <laughs> yeah, I'm worried about his education. Yes, 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 as we should be. <laughs> Hammocking? You could hammock. That's exactly. I didn't know See, that was you a could category. do that, I, Michael. I could do that. Well, I don't have a hammock, but I could. You could find that, one uh, in a hammock. Yeah. Maybe that's how this young man won. He was studying in a hammock. And got lots of <laughs> Are there questions either about SD twenty twenty or something else that or we can any answer? Of anything? Your experience. So we're we just, happy to so talk about. So we have about. freshman parents, senior parents. We didn't get so sophomore. 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 Yeah. Future. 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 Nice. Future. How long in the future? What year were you working as high school? Oh, great. Senior. That's great. And yeah, where are you from? Michigan. Northville. Oh, Northville. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm from St. Cloud. I'm here. Oh, great. Oh, her mom. And where did you go to school? Did, did, so we didn't have to debate. We didn't have to yeah. debate. We didn't, you, yeah, we didn't have to debate. Yeah. Okay. Because sometimes there's some competition if there's a Johnny or Benny in the couple, and then there's another school. But, so are, are you looking now? Have you? And nice. are you coming if you get in? Uh, so I won't say anything. All I can do is just mess it up. So <laughs> look forward to seeing you next fall. And That's great. How's, well, How's it so going? A couple more years. I'm glad to hear You're a sophomore that. now. Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah, she's a Benny. Well, yeah. Well, she could have been a sophomore in high school. <laughs> I mean, you look older than that. Okay, I'll just stop. Yeah, just <laughs> quit, quit digging. I got it. Yeah, yeah, quit digging. So, questions? Any, Comments? Anything about anything your experiences at all? Yep. that you hear? Just that it's a different campus. It's different campus. 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 It's pretty amazing. It, 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 so it's a, it's a very good experience. So you, and it's, I know it's been like this forever. And all part of the whole experience you know, with football and, and all the different academic things that have come into play. So we came here, she dropped her off a few weeks ago, and knowing that he's going to be coming here next fall, he's interested in astronomy. So nice. we visited the astronomy building. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And say, hey, can we stop by the That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so things like that, I think, are, are good for us. I don't know if every school does that. Don't well, do. they don't. I mean, and, and, we're, and we realize the reason, part of the reason that we're not inexpensive, as you all know, is because of those kinds of things. There's a kind of personalized aspect to the education that, you know, the University of Minnesota and the University of Michigan, they, they can't duplicate that. It's just a different economic model that they're doing. And, you know, that works great for some students, but for students that want that kind of personal attention and the kind of mentoring piece, um, you know, we, we really are, and you know, there are other places like us. We're not the only two places in the country that are, are, are like us, but you know, the, the data suggests that if you look at the percentage of college students who go to, to residential liberal arts schools like St. Ben's and St. John's, it's 
four percent of college students go to places like this you know so the vast majority are going to you know bigger and often you know big state schools and you know that that's served us well i say as an economist and we've gotten lots of great people that get educated that way but i just am so deeply committed based on my own experience as an alum here and seeing what we do for students to that that experience as an undergraduate it, it, it is worth every penny because it lasts a lifetime. It provides you with the kind of skills uh, professionally. It, it allows you to get great graduate school opportunities. You know, one of the things that, that you will see with your children probably, we about two thirds of our students now want to get some kind of graduate degree. And so I, I often tell students if you're looking at, at the University of Minnesota or St. John's, you know, well, those are two pretty different places. So you can do both those things. You can come to St. John's for your undergraduate experience and then we'll send you on to get an astronomy PhD at Michigan. You know, so you can do both those things, but that personalized piece and the kind of mentoring that comes with that, it really does make a difference. There was a study that came out recently that looked at graduates from all kinds of schools across all, uh, type, all types of schools, and they were trying to assess not just economic outcome, what they, I think the word they used was thriving, and they defined thriving as some combination of professional success, personal success, before. happiness. Mm -hmm. um, so they put together some measure of what it meant to be thriving. And then they tried to figure out what, what led to thriving in your adult life. Um, and it turned out that the variable that mattered most was, at least at the college level, was did you have one significant mentoring relationship when you were in college? And you know we read that. and. You know, on the one hand, said, "Duh, you know, this is a, this is no surprise." But then we also said, "One, you know, that's that's crazy." I mean, I would hope that our students, when they graduate, would have you know two or three or four people that they feel like they've really connected with and provided a kind of mentoring relationship. And ideally, that mentoring relationship will last maybe even a lifetime. The, the people that I that were mentors for me, you know, I, two of them I still see on a regular basis. Now it doesn't hurt that I came back. To St. John's, where they were, but I was I'd stayed in touch with them already. So, you know that that personalized piece it does make a difference. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but this is partly just trying to counter that national trend that says, you know, get the cheapest degree you can. All bachelor's degrees are created the same. They're not. It's not I a commodity. Just, even our accessibility to the two of you, um, yeah. you know, in, in some of my social groups, all our kids are the same age. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we do enjoy a selfie. Yeah, she's a selfie queen. So, um, so, I, so I think just you know, community, personal relationships, mentors. We're sitting here having a conversation with you. Yeah. You know, you guys split it. Yeah. Well, and you also, I think that the other piece that's unique to St. Ben's and St. John's is the relationship among alums when they graduate. So I always say you never see one Benny or one Johnny. You, you see them in groups, right? I mean, and you're, you're a testament to that. You keep in touch with your roommates. So, and it starts when they're students. So last year I had first year students who sent out Christmas cards as roommates. That's how they were sharing their, their holiday joy. And so it's, I mean, that's, that's wonderful. And that network carries you through life personally. I and mean, when you have difficult times, you have this core group you can go back to but also professionally, and I have not seen that at any other institution. I think that does make us unique, even among liberal arts institution, that sense of community that carries with you. So I've never met a Johnny when I didn't meet the Johnny's roommate. I mean, that's just the way, the way they seem to travel. No, I think that's true. I mean, we've, the, the network is kind of, kind of famous in Minnesota, and you hear, you know, I had Johnny's tell me that they've got next door neighbors that went to Gustavus, another fine liberal arts school, very much like St. John's and St. Ben's. And you know, their neighbor would say to them, you know, what is it about you Johnny's and Benny's? You know, we we didn't have that same sort of feeling at Gustavus. And you guys are you guys are some kind of cult or something. You know, generally a benign version of a cult. But, you know, but it's and and it, it was a powerful thing. You know, Mary and I get to go to, to admissions events and to meet parents and students that are looking at schools and. You know, I 
always ask the, the parent and, and student, you know, was, was there a previous St. John's or St. Ben's connection in the family? Are you a, a legacy? Um, and about a third of our students are, but I was at an event where I was talking to a mom and she said, no, there was no previous St. Ben's or St. John's connection. And so I said, so what made you interested in what made your son interested in looking at St. John's. And she said, well, I work with a lot of Johnnies and Bettys. And you know, every single one of them is just so nice. Now, at that point, I thought, well, every single one? Is that possible? <laughs> just seemed to be a statistical anomaly. But, but I didn't, I, I know, I, 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 I didn't say it. But I just thought it. But, but then she said, she said, and the other thing is, they all have each other's backs. They're, they're there for each other. And, and she didn't make it sound like it was a kind of an exclusive thing. That, you know, it was they would do something for a Johnny or Benny that they wouldn't do for someone else. But it was just that she had the sense that there was this kind of support. And she was talking about it professionally. But she said, I want that kind of community for we my son. We've actually had this conversation, the two of us, where, we, that, where I give her a hard time because we, uh, we, when we used to live in Minnesota, we lived in Plymouth and we would go to Holy Island Church. And I'm one of these people. Whatever, whatever, whatever it is, like when this meeting's done, I'll be the first person out the door. Not because I didn't enjoy the meeting, but it's done. So, <laughs> right. so when mass is done and then we're going, I'm walking out to the car and she's talking to someone, you know, at the church that somehow she recognized from 20 years ago at St. Anne's. <laughs> and so they have to talk for 15 minutes. But we, we, we've had a conversation where I've never met a Johnny or a Benny who wasn't nice. Yeah. I mean, bottom line, Nice they're, they're good people. Yeah. yeah. And they're and they're everywhere. So where yeah. were you was it Alaska you got off the plane yeah. and bumped into a Johnny? I mean you can't you can't go anywhere and not see <laughs> Bettys and Johnny. So if you wear your gear you yeah. that's that's exactly right. That's no, but that, that's actually way I'm pushing the brand. Yeah, well, no, absolutely. well thank you. No, that's right. We should get that. I agree. <laughs> I agree. You can talk to her about something. <laughs> her budget's in better shape. <laughs> But I think the interesting point, that's, I mean, the, the notion that, that they're everywhere, that's a way in which your children's education is better than mine was. Um, we're a much more geographically, racially, economically, religiously diverse student body now than when I was a student. I, I joke, only half joking, that I came from Iowa and I was a diversity candidate at the time <laughs> because we we're so Minnesota based and, and the Minnesotans didn't let me forget it. Um, but now, the, the the state that has the second largest number of, of students in our first year class, after Minnesota, of course, is California. You, know, you might think, you know, how can it not be Wisconsin or Illinois or Iowa or, or even the Dakotas? It's, it's California. And third, and, that's, is and third is Texas. Texas. You know, so we're, well, <laughs> yeah. so part of it is we just, I mean, the demographics are, are a challenge in the upper Midwest. There just aren't as many high school students as we would like to be recruiting. So we started to reach out nationally. and. The other thing that's that's true is those those are two states that they have some small liberal arts schools, but relative to their population, they are way underserved. They're mostly big state institutions. Yeah, there's some great private schools there too, but um, a lot of students that want a small that small experience. You know, and and, if, and from the St. John side, in a lot of cases, that they're young men that want to continue their um, athletic interests, so they have a passion for sport, they're not going to be a D1 athlete, and they want to come to a place where they can pursue that, but still get a great education. And so, you know, we're, we're just getting, we're going to be increasingly diverse in the years ahead. And that's, our plan is partly designed to address those issues, but we're starting to see it already. You know, we have so many more students from outside of Minnesota, and they're so, but they're so much more diverse than when I was here. And it's a great thing for the students that are here, because that's the world they're going to live in. Well, I don't want to, I mean, we're happy to stay and chat. You, you have access to us for as long as you want to chat, but um, it's, it's 1130. We wanted to make sure you get a chance to do other things. If you're going to go to the football game, you're going to grab a bite to eat. Um, you may want to go see your, your, your son. If he, He's probably out of bed by now. Um, <laughs> the Our daughters are up already. The sons. <laughs> so, a year from now, you can be sleeping. It's a good well, day. Th thank you for, thank for you coming. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it.